Thank you for joining my art desk, sponsored by the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation. Okay. Welcome to week two of spring drawing, because we all need to go outside more. I'm drawing at my desk, just because I have these giant photography lights set up here so that you can see. But I hope you're drawing out someplace really beautiful, just sitting outside in the heat. It's also not raining right now, so it's a good time to go outside. Um, today is April 6th, 1 p.m., and I have to confess that I messed up the recording, and this is a re-recording of the lecture that I gave on April 6th at 1 p.m. And today's lesson is drawing and accuracy and shading for spring drawing class through the Palo Alto Art Center. Take this away. Um, so welcome to Anne's Art Desk. Today's lesson is about drawing accuracy and shading. Um, and we're going to start with essentially chapter one of today's lecture is drawing accuracy. And we're going to talk about sizing and proportioning your drawing so that it ends up the right size for the paper. Just you're sketching your drawing to get a sense of how it will fill the paper. Checking on angles to make sure your drawings are accurate and doing some negative shape work. My class notes and lots of recommendations for book reading and drawings I've done in class. Other samples and ideas are available on the Google Classroom. The class code is right here, AQ4FDRS. And if you want to sign up for the week after this week, I think we have two more weeks after this week, or review of previous lessons, or see the syllabus for the next set of lessons I'm going to present that I haven't put up yet, you can look at palotoartcenterfoundation.org slash events, eaacf.org. All right, and to begin, I'm gonna just bring a lot of paper up here. So the first part of this lesson involves sizing and proportioning your drawing. And in this case, I've set up this nice little viewfinder so you can see uh, where things might end up. And I'm going to try and draw what you see when you look down at my desk. Um, so the first step, size, proportion. And then on top of that little sketch, we're going to do gesture. Sketch, just so that we have a sense of where the drawing will be. Um, so I'm going to give it a frame to live in. I'm finding that difficult to see on screen, so I'm going to switch to something real quick. Like that. So the frame copies the frame I have on my desk. So the drawn frame copies the frame on my desk. And I'm going to actually just draw three lines like this. Oh, here is my favorite black ring. You can use any pencil you have. This is a perfectly good pencil. I'm using the darker pencil just so that you can see it more easily as you look into the picture. So the first thing I'm going to do is think about how much space the flower fills and where the main objects go off the page. So about like that. Um, so when I'm thinking about size, I want it to fit inside the picture much like it does inside the frame, the wooden frame on my desk. So that's sizing and proportion. Notice it took one to two seconds. And the gesture sketch takes about that amount of time. Maybe a little longer. Um, but I want to just look at how how the different elements in my drawing go fit in the picture. Um, I'm going to just color it in much darker than I would in real life so you can see it on the screen. So here's a gesture sketch for you, but done a little bit too dark. So that's step one and two. Kind of a total of 20 or 30 seconds with talking. Without talking, it could be 10 seconds. So then my next step, I'm just going to repeat the drawing. Um, and this is sort of a checking. Um, so we're going to check on our proportions and our gesture sketch using angles. I think I called this step three. And negative shapes. So let me demonstrate the angle part of this. So I have my my gesture sketch. Gesture sketch goes like this and like that, like that. 
Um, and now what I want to do is check that things are sort of in the right place and are the right size. And I can do that in a very simple way just by checking that this goes like that and that. Does it really go like that? I can literally move the angles over. And the stem goes pretty much up and down, which is good to know. And this whole bunch of lavender leaves kind of fits in right there. Um, so I've checked my angles. Um, you can check angles from three-dimensional objects as well as two-dimensional objects. Um, but I think that lesson may require in-person instruction. So I'm not really going to go into it here. Kind of the next step, which is sort of cool, um, is to Think about the shapes that are not the flowers and the leaves and the petals. So here's a negative shape that's bounded by the outer frame and then goes in here. These are a few little lavender petals and then here's the flower. Okay, so there's a negative shape right there. And when I say negative shape, I mean the shape that isn't the subject. So this whole shape. There's another one here, and you can do, draw even very rough negative shapes. They will help you too. So there's one here. Sometimes people do something like this and actually fill them in so you can really see them clearly because the scratchy line doesn't really tell you as much as you might like. There's this negative shape as well. Make the shape about like this. And it's everything in here. And then there's one really nice negative shape right here. And some little more negative details about there. That's the negative shape drawing. And the negative shapes are awesome because they let you check your positive shapes. Um, and then once you have yes it is a flower or no it is not a flower you can use the same negative shape concept inside shapes um, so once you combine angles negative shape gesture and positioning you probably have a much more complicated problem here's a negative shape drawing i did earlier of a very similar setup and then the final step is to kind of combine them and essentially lay over the top of your gesture, size, proportion, shape, and angles, a finished sketch. And let me just do this quickly with a pencil because that's how you really see the magic. And what I'm going to do is repeat the drawing I already had. Like this. Right? And keeping inside my angles and sizing this flower so it's big enough. I've noticed I'm putting it down too far. Right there. What I can now do is essentially go back to the negative shape part of the deal. Like I notice that this is actually up here. Something that's super nice about all these drawing tricks is that they teach you to see the things as they actually are, which is one of the wonderful side effects of drawing. So there's a negative shape here. Remember, it comes down around the outside of the frame. If you haven't got a frame, um, something you can also do is just draw a frame like that. Um, negative shape here. And I'm trying to draw what you see on your camera when you look at my art desk instead of what I see by looking at my art desk. So there's a negative shape, but I'm not going to fill it in this time because I'm trying to do a different drawing. Um, then I need this negative shape over here, right? And look how in drawing these negative shapes, I'm drawing, I'm drawing them what I actually want, which is the flower. And there's another, there's a negative shape here, but it's too close. And there's another negative shape here. And then it goes around here. You see some of the contour of the petals. And then you, you leave the flower and you start drawing these petals because this is all one negative shape right there. 
this whole area. Um, but then I want this shape, which is really cool. And there's also a little negative shape there. Now I can draw the difference between the bulk of the leaves and the flower. Essentially, the result of all this contour drawing played over negative shape, gesture, and proportion, and angles is what essentially is going to come out looking pretty much like the color we looked for, which we lost again on the slip over here. Something wrong with that. Here's some petals for you. Drawing, drawing, drawing. There's all these cute little uprights in here. And these leaves have very interesting long sort of blade like shapes. Put these petals in. Again, I'm essentially trying to create this sort of um, this kind of um, coloring book look. And then what's kind of neat about this and here's sort of magic. See how all of my um little sketchy lines are still there? But it looks really quite pro. You have to wait, be careful to let your pen dry if you have a pen that dries a little more slowly. But it can look really quite pro if you then erase all your what I call sort of thinking lines and just draw your finished lines. You know, the better the paper you have, the lighter the pencil you use, the better this works. This is a really um, hard pencil and you press really hard, it can be quite difficult to erase those. So if you use a light touch, you can just sort of pencil back on the paper. So again, making sure the ink is dry. You sweep all your little bits off. And then what's fun um, is to just take anything you've got and you can color it in as if it were. Part is just, um, just make things whatever color you want. Um, you can use this pretty blue for um, the lavender flowers, and the combo of the purple and the blue. Um, I have a pretty yellow. Notice that nothing I'm using is super. Just using what I have. Um, some things need to be gray green and some things need to be yellow green. So here's a nice sort of gray green. And here's for this M. And then maybe I want some other green for this. Kind of cute, this sort of bright orange. There we go. So you have it, a little coloring book page. Um, here's one I did earlier for a previously not recorded right lecture. Um, let me turn over my my notes and I'll give you the next part. So once you have combined, just to revisit what we did, once you have combined all these tools. Sizing your, sizing your drawing accurately, doing a quick gesture sketch, checking your angles and checking your negative shape, you should have a fairly accurate drawing. All of this works again in three-dimensional drawing when you're looking up and out at something, but for the simplicity of doing this online, I just did a flat lay drawing. I think it would be much harder to demonstrate. Um, so the next, this is sort of chapter two of this lesson. Chapter two, as promised, is a little bit about shading. And I include this here because during week one, people started asking me about it. Um, so when you're thinking about shading, it's sometimes helpful to start with just um, kind of a conceptual idea of shading. And something that you can really tell is if you draw six kind of round shapes, or just 
I'm not drawing anything real right now. I'm just imagining what how light behaves because light usually behaves mostly in the same way. If I set the light source over here, then the shadow gets cast this way. And the body shadow appears on this side of the round ball. If I put the light here, you get something called rim lighting. And I end up in this scenario. So Monet loved this. This is sort of a very classical way to light a portrait. And you'll see it a lot on Rembrandt's paintings and the other classical portraits. The same is true for this, this scenario as well, where you put the light over here. It casts the shadow this way. Okay. Something that's kind of interesting about these, um, to be avoided, I would say, here are a couple of scenarios to be avoided. One is to have, um, this is what we see a lot when you're indoors in like an industrial space, like in a cubicle space or in a classroom, you see this overhead lighting. Everything is a little fuzzy. You also see it on foggy days. And it's not that I hate this light. It's just that it's um, quite difficult to draw because nothing is very specific. So if you're working on teaching yourself value, you might want to avoid these scenarios, this sort of foggy overhead light. Um, you know, if you enter a classroom and there are 40 different lights all turned on, it's not a good place to learn light. The other thing that's super difficult is if you have all sorts of different colored lights bouncing around the room, say there's a window here, it's giving light, um, you get this very sort of overlit, overcast shadow. You don't really know what's going on. There are cast shadows everywhere. You can geek out on this scenario and enjoy it, but it's going to be difficult to draw. No problem. If you want to draw it, go right ahead. But it's it's kind of an extra special challenge. Um, interestingly, this is pretty much the scenario of the studio. Unless I monkey with the lights, which is why I'm always monkeying with the lights. All right. So that is a little bit of sort of background about how light behaves and what it always does. Here's a sort of an interesting scenario. The shadow tells you a lot about what the object is doing. So if I put the shadow here, you immediately conclude that the object is floating. Um, when the shadow is there, the tabletop that it's on is implied, right? That's kind of interesting. All right. Let me note that over again. So here is sort of the next step up. And this is one I call anatomy of light. And again, we are imagining a scenario. So this is another imaginary scenario. Um, and light sort of has some very standard ways it appears in your life. And it's kind of a natural history and an anatomy of light. When you are doing a drawing that is based on light and dark, you are doing a mass drawing, not a line drawing. We talked a little bit about this last week. Um, but what I'm going to start with is a line drawing. Here's my lines. I'm going to do it in pencil because I always end up erasing something because I want it to go back to being light. Okay, so here's my line drawing of this imaginary object. The light is designated to come from here inside my mind. Um, and there are some kinds of light that are interesting to talk about that will help you when you look at the rest of the world. So here they are. I'm going to label them. And be aware, this is still a line drawing. And as soon as we start adding light and dark, we end up in mass drawing. OK, so there's highlight. Let me switch back to pen. Um, there's body light, which is where the light is falling directly on this object. There's body shadow, which is sort of the dark side of the moon. There's core shadow, which is kind of an extra dark part of the shadow. I'm going to do more detail if you need. There's cast shadow. 
there's now two more you haven't maybe haven't thought of yet. Reflected light. And we also, because this is a mass drawing, we're going to be in shadow. We need sort of a background tone. So let me um, let me just go to town on this. I'm going to essentially color it in so you can see what I mean. Okay. There's my light source. Okay, here we go. Um, so first of all, everything that's not a highlight, it's going to be a little bit darker. And you'll see that I have this really sketchy, scribbly line. And notice that I'm essentially just washing in everything that isn't the white. And that includes the background tone, because it's got to be something in order for that white to pop out. Unless, unless the tabletop is as light as the highlight, in which case you don't make a difference between the highlight. So everything except for the highlight is going to have some kind of a tone. Like that. And all the way around. Then you start developing. You don't have to do it this way. You can go work dark to light or whatever, but I'm essentially just trying to treat it as rationally as possible. My next step is going to be everything that the light is not shining on is over here. So it's all going to be a little bit darker. And then there's this idea that there's a core shadow area where no light is being reflected up into the body of the object that we're actually going to And that would be you see this on faces a lot. Let me see this on faces. So it's already looking rounder. So now we are definitely over here in mass drawing. And because we're in mass drawing, you can have some fun and get rid of all of the lines and start showing the differences between your shape and the outside shape or whatever shape is next to it by using shade values rather than bottom. So previously to this moment we had been lines to show how things look like now we're just using that shape to show something that's kind of neat that I didn't label is right here it's gonna be sort of an extra dark where the object meets the table. Maybe right here too where it sort of casts an extra dense an extra dense um, shadow. The other thing that's kind of interesting is right here, if you add in the reflected light, see how much rounder it looks? Reflected light is tricky though. It can never be lighter than your light, right? It has to always be a part of the shadow space and where you're going to shadow that. So I have to work with that down a little bit. Kind of seems to be like there's space for that. Um, so that's my imaginary shape. And, um, Something I did in the video, which I thought was kind of clever, um, is I circled all the parts again just so you can see them again. So body light, highlight is right here, body light is here. Um, body shadow kind of in involves all of this stuff, but can be divided into a couple of pieces. So body shadow, and then there's going to be a core shadow and a reflected light. And then the whole thing casts a shadow. Like that, cast shadow. And most things cast a shadow. And then the background tone just got put in as well. You can fuzz out pencil, which is one nice thing. It's going to be anatomy of light. And it appears pretty much everywhere there is light. And you'll start seeing it. Um, so now what I did previously is I put this orange here. And I drew a picture. Let me show you the one I did before, and then I'll just do it quickly again. Just I wanted you to see um, how you would do it in life. Here it is again. So. Here is this orange looked at from the camera angle and drawn on a piece of paper. And you'll notice that all the bits are there. 
um, set for the occlusion shadow. So we're going to just cast shadow right here. And I think that is the end of that one. So during, during the time I was making these ones, somebody asked me, but what about, what is contour sheet? And I have to say that I love this question because I love contour sheeting. And I tend to do it a lot. You haven't noticed that much, but um, we haven't been talking about it. Let's say I wanted to draw the orange with contour shading. Actually, I kind of would like to draw what I did before. Um, because it's actually a different shape, which means you could draw a different shape. Um, you can draw anything you want, anything you've got around. Um, if you're trying to teach yourself shading, I recommend a solid object like this, not a delicate rose with lots of petals. Interesting. Just a simple, straightforward shape where you can study the light pretty well. So once again, I sort of position, I'm going to position the drawing over here like this. I'll use a different paper. So, so I draw my whatever I'm going to draw. I include the cast shadow, even though it's at a funky angle, but that's so you can see it too. Um, and draw sort of whatever elements of it I see. Here's its really beautiful highlight, and here's its outer edge. Um, I think I got sort of fancy during my class, and I spontaneously drew the teacup, and that went better than I expected. A cute little handle over here. Um, so contour shading re relies on this concept um, of aspect. And aspect is about direction. Aspect is about the direction a marble would roll if it were on the surface. So when people are drawing with aspect in mind, if they're drawing a mountain, they will often draw it like this. So that you can see the shape of the mountain. And then sky might be shaped like this. Uh, trees might be shaped like this. Those trees look a little bit familiar. Um, water might be shaped like this because that's the direction a marble would roll if you dropped it on. It would just roll across the surface. Whereas if you dropped it here, it would just fall straight down. Here, it would make its way down the mountain. So that's the sort of concept of aspect. I always think of it in terms of um, landscape because I'm often a landscape painter and so it becomes useful. And it's, it's really about making your lines follow the contours of what you want. Direction. That makes sense? So in terms of this pair, it's very round and things go around. So one contour line you could use would be one like that. Or it could go like that. Um, you can also use contour lines that go like this, go around here, ones that cross it, and essentially you get this hatching system that can follow the dimension, the dimensionality of the object you're drawing. Because there are lots of ways um, things go around this pair. They can go around this way, they can go like this. But see how the lines actually help to describe the shape of the pair. I am not the world's best person at this, um, but there are lots of ways to study it and lots of ways to play with it. And you can also just study it and play with it. Um, it's looking kind of bulbous there because of the lines I've chosen, which I'll see what happens with. I find that as I relax into it, I get better at it. So see here, I'm here. I'm sort of filling in a core shadow, but using contour lines. So this is contour shading at its sort of roughest. And then you'll notice in the original, um, there's this teacup, and you could use um, directional lines to show the shape of the teacup. So 
the rim goes around and the shadow goes like this. And then it also goes around, so you can use those lines as the contour, counter, counter patching. Like that. Um, and then both, both objects cast shadows. Not like that. And for the cast shadows, you could use a, a line like this. It actually shows the direction of the light. And might keep it very simple because you want people to look at the teacup and the pear. Um, often if I'm shading and I really want something, I'll actually try and hit the gaps uh, like this. It's not the best. Oh, something that's very useful for drawing is a sense of what your potential grays are and understanding kind of a menu of options for grays. Um, and to do that, you can make a grayscale with each tool you have. So here's a pencil grayscale. And I'm also going to make a big pen grayscale smaller because it's a smaller tool. Five steps each, and I'll finish up with a Sharpie grayscale. Like that. Um, kind of the simplest way to do this is to, this is gonna be white, and this will be your darkest dark. Not all tools can get to black, so we're just going to call that darkest one, two, three, four, five. Sort of one way to do it is to just make one pass over each step. You don't have to put anything here because we want to keep it the color of the paper. And then make another pass over the next set. And then another pass over the last two. And our final pass over the last one. You want the steps between them to be fairly equal, so this, so the the steps are equal to each other. Um, and something you'll notice that this is 50, 50, 1, and 5, and this is 50, 50, 3, and 5. Is that right? Half and half, half and half. Um, if you're color mixing, you also see the same phenomenon of colors. You're doing color swatches. Okay, that's pencil. Um, here's a big pen. The other way to do it is to sort of start with your lightest light and your darkest dark. And to get a really dark with a big pen, you can just keep patching over it until it fills in the paper. There aren't any little white spots left. Then something that's kind of fun to do is to kind of jump your next step up to your midtone. And then fill in the the light tones or the the intermediary tones separately. So see how this one has to go darker to fit into the lineup. That one darker still. Maybe this one has to be a little bit darker. Maybe there's actually a sixth spot on this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, white. Okay, this is another way to do it. This one's kind of interesting, Sharpie, because um, the Sharpie is so, such a blunt instrument and it's all of a sudden as dark as it goes. So again, white needs nothing. Next one up needs a very light touch. And then this one will have a few more lines to make it a little bit darker. Oh, there you have it. One, two, three. Um, I think I also talked a little bit about um, hatch lines. So you can change the density of your hatches. So here's a really light density. To make it look darker, you can add some in between. It's one way. Um, you can change the thickness of the lines you use. This is a chisel tip, so it's pretty easy to demonstrate it. Um, Usually when I'm making hatches, I rotate my hatch line at some sort of non-45, non-90 degree angle. 
If you do it like this, you get this kind of checkerboard thing. Your hatches also start looking like a Mirandi drawing if you want to go look him up. He's kind of a wonderful jazz person um, and a good painter. Um, so you can make very light hatches by making light lines that are far spaced far apart and very dark hatches by passing over your hatching until it fills all the way in. Again, I like the sort of this kind of angle when I change my hatch lines. At this point, um, one of my students asked for contour shading. And I'm going to do a little drawing about contour shading. Let me get another piece of paper. Oh, um, Alphonse Dunn wrote a wonderful book called Pen and Ink Drawing which if you love geeky stuff, he does this so well and explains it so well if you want a deep dive into the topic, into ink drying and shading and how to make it all look really, really marvelous because he can do that. Okay, let's see, next page. At that point, uh, the main part of the lesson was finished, but I did do this sort of little last extra coda for this lesson. This is kind of a little about your tools vocabulary. Um, lesson. So every drawing instrument, every brush, every medium, okay, sorry, okay, it has a vocab. And um, tools have vocabulary. Sort of the one that's the most flexible that we're so used to seeing all the time is a pencil, but even a Sharpie has a good vocabulary. See how light and wispy it can be if you back way off and just sort of make easy little mark. Or I can do this. Or I can do this. Do this. But it has a big vocabulary for such sort of a lumpy little tool. I like it. Lots of Sharpies. All the words a Sharpie can make. Maybe you can see if you can you can make it have more. Here's my gel pens. Vocab, and it can actually it, ha it can have a light touch too if you back way off. Um, can be nice for doing initial sketching, and it can also make a really nice dark solid mark. But it doesn't have much beyond its one width setting. Um, a pencil, kind of flexible. It can do this, can do this, can do this, or that. It also has this one more word that the others don't have, which is this one. Kind of nice. Um, and then my chisel pen. Let's see if there's room for one more. Here's my chisel pen. This is kind of nice because you can use the corner, you can use the flat, you can use the vertical. You can make dots or little squares. If I start doing this, you should probably start seeing some Van Goughiness to it because he was using an, a croquil ink dip pen. Probably like a Japanese bamboo pen, even. Um, but if you look at his paintings, you see a lot of these kinds of marks in his paintings. And literally, if I look closely at his paintings, I can see him pretending that each mark is a brush stroke. So there's a kind of angle. All right. That's vocab. And with that, I think my lecture is finished. Um, if you want to share your artwork online, um, let me recommend that you tag it. E A A C at home. Or you can send it to the Palo Alto Art Center by using their handle. Wow. Talking and writing at the same time is not my strong suit. Palo Alto Art Center. This is for sharing like on Facebook or Instagram. If you want to talk to me directly on Instagram, I am Anne Nick.
。はい。はい。There's another thing you can do, and that is this is the classroom code if you want to see all these materials again.、Um, the videos and the registration are posted at this address if you want to sign up for next week. And if you want to look at classroom materials, recommended books,、um, drawings that I did during my lecture, you can sign into classroom.google.com and put in this code AQ4MBRS. Thank you very much for joining me. Next week, we are going to do one of my favorite things,、um, which is to、uh, do pen and ink drawings. And then put color inside them. So,、um, whatever you bring next week,、um, bring like a pen, a black pen, and some colors. So,、um, something like that, or this, or this. You can also do it with pencil if that's what you have. This is a black wing, but you can also do it with this, a number two.、Um, these are watercolor pencils. And we're going to be doing something a little bit like that. You could also bring a watercolor kit.、Uh, right here, if you have one.、Uh, even a children's school kit, the work will look lovely. It doesn't really matter what quality of watercolor you bring. Okay, see you next week, 1 p.m. on Monday. Take care. Thank you for joining my art desk. These videos are sponsored by the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation. So, here's an example I did in class of contour shading.、Um, and I'm just going to show you、uh, with the same setup as what I did in class. And then I drew from that setup. So, let's see. I think I used, oddly enough, I used this little gel pen. Um, mainly, I'm using dark pens so that you can see them on the camera. So, I started with a little pencil sketch like this, so I knew where I was going. And I'm going to draw from the camera view I have set up rather than my view looking at my desk, just so you can see what I'm drawing. And there's a cast shadow. I think in class I got fancy and started drawing the teacup as well. A little toy teacup. Pretty cast shadow glancing through it right there. Anyway, contour drawing is kind of neat because rather than drawing just with random hatches and filling it in slowly, you look at the shape the thing makes. So these lines, these lines, these lines, these lines, these lines. And each shading mark helps you see the overall shape. Of what you're drawing.、Um, so you can draw some contour lines that describe how it curves like this. You can shade it in with contour lines that describe how it sort of flows away. Something I'll often do is like draw a little values map. So just like,、uh, let me refer back to the last picture. So let's take this one for instance.、Um, Essentially, what I do is assign these values that are separated out here. So, this little highlight is a number one, pure white. This one is going to be a number two, this area, as is probably the table. Maybe the table is going to be 1.5.、Um, over here, we have threes and fours. Down here, we have a five, and maybe the stem is a six. So, that's a little value map for you. So, six,、uh, three, and four. Two, one, 1.5. Cast shadow, we're going to say, what is our cast shadow? Cast shadow is going to be probably a three, maybe a four, maybe a five, depending. Maybe five here, four here, three there. All right. Let's erase those. 
Um, so having that sort of a map in mind, I can then draw contour shading like this, where I'm using this direction of the line to show the shape of the pair. Um, this is kind of a different system than doing this, where the direction of the line has very little to do with the shape of the pair. And it's cross-hatching, right? So you can still cross-hatch it. Just make your crosses help show the shape of the pair. And since I have only one spot that's pure white, I have to sort of color in the rest of it. Um, this is where I sort of go into scribble bot mode. And I'm trying not to do my scratchy scratchy thing for your benefit. Let's see. There's also just like um, with our anatomy drawing, we have the same elements of highlight, cast shadow, body shadow. Can't see it in there. Body shadow in there, and core shadow. Body light is going to be over here. All these same elements appear, but because the pear is a different shape from the orange, they also assume a different shape. I want to leave the little bit of reflected light I see because I'm working in pen. I can't get it back once it's gone. And there's this nice little if I color this all the way in, it starts to look almost immediately like a pear. Okay, now I need a little bit more body core shadow to really look real. And then I have sort of completely ignored the cast shadow. Notice that the cast shadow, because it's on a sort of flat surface, I'm not doing the contour lines, and that tells you something about the surface, that it's flat. So there it is as you sort of see it. You can get all fancy with the cup and use the contour lines like to describe the top, the rim. I want to keep the rim bright, so I'm going to protect it essentially. A little bit of light in there that I lost, which is too bad. Um, and then there's also this sort of beautiful shape here. But see how, if I want to show that the cup is deep, I can show it with these beautiful contour lines. We're looking down into it. Then it gets considerably darker over here. So not only does it go down, but it also goes around, and I can use the contour lines to show that surrounding it that it has. So there you have it, a little bit of contour shading for you. This also goes around as well as up and down and you can use that too. A little bit of darkness here just to make the hair pop up. Okay, there you have it. I'm going to stop scribbling now. Um, and that is contour shading. If you want to know more about this, a useful word is aspect. You can think of aspect as the direction a marble would roll if it was put on the surface. So like this and like that, around, up, around, um, over and just away. These ones should probably be either vertical or sideways. These ones go down, these ones go down and around. What kind of thing can be useful to think about. All right. I think it looks very cool. So you can just make up a hatch mark that works for you. Put a count on that. Um, 